All right, we're live. Hello, Facebook. Welcome. A little bit late this morning, coming on live from the Oasis. We were having a wonderful time of fellowship and prayer in our Zoom room with our fellow Oasis members, but we're glad we're here with you now. And let's pray as we get into our study of God's Word. So, Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all of your truth. Lord, we ask that your Spirit would open our eyes to your ways that he would show us your path, that he would lead and guide us into your truth and teach us. You are the God of our salvation, and we look to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. That is where we are going to be reading. And we are in part two of a message I started last week called, finally, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. We are still in our series, Who's the Boss? Women and Men in Biblical and Cultural Context. We've been doing this, um, this uh, teaching on reconstructing the world of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. The idea has been that in order to understand the verse, well, matter of fact, let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's start, let's start at verse, um, verse 8, where Paul says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner, also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. I'm going to read the rest. Verse 13, 14, 15. For Adam was formed first in Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Now, we've been focusing on primarily trying to understand what exactly does 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 mean in its literary context as well as in its cultural context. What were the beliefs? What were the practices? What were the customs of the people of the day? And could that give us any insight into what Paul is meaning when he says, I suffer not a woman to teach, or I per, I'm reading, I'm thinking old King James, well, but I, uh, the new King James says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. So we've been looking at what that means. And in our last session together, we explored the meaning of teach. In part one of this, we looked at what does teach mean in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. I'm not going to go over all of that because I covered that in the last section, in the last session, but I argue that teach here is not referring to the apostolic public teaching of doctrine that happens in every church gathering. As Mike Winger has said, as some complementarians have argued, that the word teach here has to do with women teaching apostolic doctrine, that they're teaching good doctrine, biblical doctrine, within the church, in the presence of men. And this is how they see it. So they see the the content of the teaching as positive, but they're saying that it is denied to women to do this, that it, that it is not for women to do this. It is not God's design for women to do this um, in, in the church, in the public setting. Again, it is they define it as apostolic or public teaching of doctrine that happens in every church gathering. And what I've said and what I'm arguing is that Paul is not prohibiting women from teaching apostolic doctrine or teaching in a public church setting or in a Bible se seminary or a Bible school, because there are those who believe that this also applies to women teaching in seminaries and colleges and schools, um, that, that Paul is not prohibiting women from doing this because they are women and that it's a job that God has designed for men. Now, we're going to be getting into verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15. I'm trying to take it a, a just a, a chunks at a time to not overwhelm you with information because I do share a lot of information, Okay. But I, I shared last week why I do not believe that this is a prohibition from Paul from teaching apostolic doctrine or teaching in a public church setting or in a Bible school or seminary simply because of the gender of women. In other words, that women can't do this because they are women, and this is only a job designed by God for men. I don't believe that. So go back and check out lesson number 62 for the details. All right. Now, um, also... The one of the reasons I don't believe this, and I'm going to share a little bit more about teaching, then we're going to talk about where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach nor to have authority 
or to have authority or to assume authority or to usurp authority over man. We're going to talk about authority this morning and what does that mean? Now, but I want to share first just a few more things that I, in, in studying this last week, I came across some other things that augment my argument for why this is not talking about women teaching apostolic doctrine in the church. In chapter one of First Timothy, we are given no indication that part of the problem at Ephesus and what Timothy is to stop are women teaching apostolic doctrine in the public assembly of men. When you go back to chapter one, verse three, Paul says, uh, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in the faith. So in, in chapter one, verse three and four, Paul is telling Timothy, I charged you to uh, tell uh, certain ones or some that they are no longer to teach other type of doctrines, meaning false teachings. This is what Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to do. It does not say he left Timothy in Ephesus to stop women teaching good apostolic doctrine in the public assembly where men are, are present. In verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2, when you look at chapter 2, you read verses 1 through 11. We are also not given, get, given any indication that the problem that Timothy is to address is women teaching apostolic doctrine to men. There is no indication, there's no antecedent, there's no con to contextual clues that Paul is saying, hey, Timothy, stop these women from teaching good, sound apostolic teaching and, or doctrine in the church. He doesn't do that. The assumption that in chapter 2, verse 12, that, that Paul is talking about apostolic, the, the public apostolic teaching of doctrine the assumption from that can only be made, or to assume that can only be made by reading pastoral authority and or eldership from, from chapter three back into chapter two and verse 12. There is, again, no indication from the literary context of chapter one and chapter two, verses one through 11, that Paul is dealing with pastoral or elder leadership and authority and that this must be prohibited to women because they are women. We see no signs of that. What we see Paul talking about in chapter one and what he's alluding to in chapter two, verses one through 11, chapter one, he's talking about, hey, uh, teach these people not to teach false teaching, other doctrine. Uh, and he talks about that. He contrasts that to sound doctrine. And he talks about Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus and Alexander how they uh, were put out, they were turned over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. And then in chapter two, verses one through 11, as I have argued, Paul is telling them the correct things to do that are the result of sound doctrine and teaching, okay? But nowhere does he say, hey, the uh, Timothy, you need to teach these women uh, or tell these, uh, these women that they cannot teach sound apostolic doctrine or teaching. We don't see this. We are given glimpses of what the false teaching is that Paul is telling Timothy to put a stop to. If you go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, we don't know fully the entire content of what the false teaching is, but we are given some glimpses of it and some of the things that Paul writes about. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So one of the things that we see is that uh, part of false teaching, people, what will arise out of that? People will speak lies and hypocrisy. Their conscience will be uh, seared, and they will forbid to marry and command to abstain from certain foods. Now, to forbid to marry would also mean that they're not going to have children, and they're going to be commanded to abstain from certain foods. So this was some of the teaching that was going forth, the, the false teaching that Paul wanted uh, Timothy to put a stop to. If we look at uh, verse 7, 
Paul says, but reject profane. This is uh, chapter four, verse seven, but reject. Um, let's start at verse six. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourselves towards godliness. So again, Paul is telling them, I want you to reject old wise fables, uh, uh, reject uh, profane and old wise fables. So this is part of the false teaching he's telling them to reject. We go over to chapter five, verse 11, chapter five, verse 11, Paul says, but refuse the younger widows for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybody, busybody saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the household, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, the implications of this is, is that the false teaching is causing the opposite of this. We already know that one of the false teachings is forbidding to marry. Paul says, I want them to marry, to bear children. I want them to um, uh, manage the household, the women to manage the household. Now, this speaks directly to something that we've talked about before, where in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul makes the statement that uh, women, I don't want, I, I don't want the women to adorn themselves with costly clothing and apparel and gold. Remember we said before that this was considered a vice in the first century world. It was the vice of luxuria and luxuria was considered one of the most dishonorable, distaste, distasteful vices in the first century Greco-Roman world. Why? Well, the idea was that if women are wearing all of this expensive clothing, elaborate hairstyles, they're not taking care of their households. They're not taking care of their husbands. They're not taking care of their children. They're not looking after the finances of their household. They're not taking care of their servants. So Paul says here, I want the uh, younger the younger widows, younger women to marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Because as we said before, in the larger Greco-Roman world, if they were involved in not doing these things, this was seen as problematic. This was seen as dangerous to the household, uh, to the empire, because you were disrupting the household. If you disrupt the household, that can end up disrupting the empire. Okay, so Rome would see the Christians as a threat, as we've covered in an earlier session. So what Paul is saying here in 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 a uh, First Timothy chapter five. He's saying, he's, in, he's telling them to engage in behaviors that are virtuous, that are contrary to what the false teaching would lead them to do, okay? Uh, if you look at chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 3. Paul goes on to say, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, revilings, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a mean of gains from such withdraw yourself. Notice again what he says here. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that if, if anyone is teaching otherwise, in other words, if they're teaching things contrary to what he said before, in chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chap and then going into chapter six. He said, if anyone's teaching anything otherwise, and if they're not consenting to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. And remember before we said that godliness means that you are uh, paying your obligations or you are fulfilling your obligations, a better way to say it. You're fulfilling your obligations to the state. You're fulfilling your obligations to your community. You're fulfilling your obligations to your household. You're fulfilling your obligations to your God. This is what it means to be godly within a first century Greco-Roman context. So this means they're being faithful to the Lord Jesus, which is one of the reasons Paul is probably saying, hey, if you are not conforming yourself to the words of Christ, you are not being godly because part of godliness is that you fulfill your obligations to your Lord, to your God, and you're not doing that, okay? But notice that Paul also says that the one who is not consenting to wholesome doctrines and words, 
He is proud knowing nothing, obsessed with disputes. Now, where did we hear that before? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. This is one of the results of the false teaching. Disputes, uh, envy, strife, revilings, evil suspicions. These are all of the things that have been mentioned before in different, in different uh, uh, chapters. And Paul is saying again, hey, if you're listening to this false teaching, this is what the false teaching would give birth to. Now, uh, let me read to you one more thing. Go to verse chapter 20 and verse 21. Chapter 20, verse 21. Oh, excuse me, not chapter 20. Chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your tr trust. Avoid the profane and idle, idle babblings. He said this before in chapter 4. He said it uh, earlier, I believe in, yeah, chapter 4 about babblings and being profane and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Again, what does this false teaching do? It gives rise to profane and idle babblings, contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. And by following this, you proceed away from the faith. Paul is repeating over and over again what he has said about what the false teachings entail and what they produce. Again, he doesn't go into great depth and detail, but we get glimpses. And he talks about what some of what they what the false, the content of the false teaching and what it produces. The reason I read to you all these passages is nowhere does Paul say, oh yeah, and tell the women to stop teaching apostolic sound doctrine. He never mentions that. The only time where we see Paul saying, uh, I, I, I am not permitting a woman to teach nor to have authority over a man is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If he is referring to, as complementarians say, as Mike Winger has argued, if he is referring to apostolic doctrine, sound doctrine, if he's referring to that, he never repeats it again. He never, he doesn't state it that this is pro prohibited in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He doesn't state it in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He doesn't state it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 5, or 6. He does state over and over again things like profane babblings, uh, disputes, arguings, departing away from the faith. These are the things that Paul wants a, to put a stop to. This is what he tells Timothy to watch out for, but he never tells him, yeah, and watch out for those women. Who, now, now think about this. Watch out for those women who, because of false teaching, are rising up and teaching apostolic doctrine, sound doctrine in the faith. Put a stop to these women teaching sound doctrine in the assembly. Technically speaking, that makes no sense, okay? So this is not... This is why I argue against the idea, and I, I am against and dispute the idea that 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 is talking about apostolic public teaching of good doctrine that is happening in every place. This is not what Paul tells Timothy to put a stop to. So, so again, Paul repeats the characteristics of the false teaching, but he never mentions women teaching sound doctrine in the public assembly as a fruit of the false teaching. He never mentions that. So it's one of, this is another reason why I say it can't, that word teach cannot be referring to apostolic doctrine. Now, doctor, here's another uh another uh piece that will that that augments, I believe, my argument. Dr. Stanley E. Porter, and I forgot to bring the book, oh, I forgot to bring it with me. But there's a book called uh, the Dr. Stanley E. Porter is a is a wonderful scholar. He's written a book called The Pastoral Epistles, a commentary on the Greek text. He offers Another insight that, again, I say augments my argument that to teach in chapter 2, verse 12, is referring to false teaching, not to apostolic doctrine, okay? Uh, Dr. Porter writes in his book, he says, quote, two contextual indicators suggest that false teaching is meant in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. There are two contextual indicators that suggest that false teaching is meant in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Now, we're just going to look at one. He said, the first involves negation, where oppositions are, create, are, are created between positive and negative statements. Let me say that again. The first contextual indicator is negation, where oppositions are created between positive and negative statements. Such instances involving negation in 1 Timothy concern negative behavior, especially in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. Paul asserts that he speaks the truth, which is a positive, and he does not lie. Now, that's in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Paul says, I speak the truth, that's a positive, and he says, and I do not lie. That's a negative, that's, that's, that's a negation. 
He says, and women are to do the positive. They are to adorn themselves appropriately. This is what we see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. They are to adorn themselves appropriately, but they are not uh, but they are not to adorn themselves in braids or ostentatious wealth. This is the negative. This is the negation. Okay. Uh, Dr. Porter goes on to say the context here is a similar negative one after, excuse me, the context here is a similar negative, is a similar, let me read that one more time. The context here in chapter two, verse 12 is a similar negative one after the positive one about a woman learning. The indication is that the teaching is false. Now, let me break this down. So what we have in chapter two, according to Dr. Porter, and I went back and I looked at this, and I went, yes, and this is kind of what I've been arguing. In chapter two, Paul has a pattern of stating a positive and then stating a negation or a negative. He states what he wants people to do that is in alignment with sound teaching. And then he states what he wants them to stop doing that is not in alignment with sound teaching, but arises from or is motivated by the false teaching. Do you get what I'm saying? Let me say that one more time. What we have in chapter two is Paul has a pattern. I call it the positive negative pattern. It's a positive negative pattern or a positive negation pattern. What is it? Paul will state something positive that he wants people to do. Then he will state something negative that he wants them to stop doing. What he wants them to do that's positive is in alignment with sound teaching. And what he wants them to do, what he wants them to stop doing that is negative is in alignment with the false teaching. That's why he wants them to stop. So we go to chapter two, verse eight. Chapter two, verse eight. Paul says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Is that a positive or negative? That's a positive. He says, I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. But then he speaks and he, and he cites the negation without wrath and doubting. So we got the positive, I mean, excuse me, without wrath and doubting or disputing. We have the positive. I want men to pray everywhere with uplifted hands, but then the negation. I want them to do it without wrath and disputing. And we've already covered that that word disputing is the same word that's used in chapter one, verse three, chapter six, verse three uh, and four that deals with disputes that arise because of the false teaching. Okay, we've talked about this in depth and in detail. So here we again, we have Paul's pattern. He states something positive. I want men to pray with uplifted hands that are holy and then the negation, but I want them to do it without wrath and doubting. Then he goes on to say, uh, let's see, Dr. Porter. Okay, so um, it, it, let's go on. Let's read it. If we look at verse nine. Paul says, in like manner also, I want that, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation. That is the positive. What is the negation? Not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. So again, we see the pattern. He states what he wants them to do. I want them to... Uh, adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and, more, and moderation. This is an alignment with sound godly teaching. But then he says, not with, uh, uh, not with braided hair or or gold or pears or costly clothing. That is the negation. And as we have studied, this is an alignment with uh, false teaching. Okay, this is a this is a, a behavior that is motivated motivated by or arises out of the false teaching. Okay. Uh, then Paul says in verse 11, um, we well, actually he states a positive in verse 10, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Verse 11, Paul says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. That's the positive. What's the negation? And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. So we have the positive, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. We, we've said before, or let a woman learn uh, they are to learn uh, with, uh, um, how do we put it? With, they are to learn without being disruptive. They are to learn being respectful and, and exercising restraint over themselves as they are learning. We said this is a positive, that these were virtues within the first century Greco-Roman world. So that's the positive. But then he gives the negation. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. So we see this positive, Ne a negative pattern throughout verses actually starts at verse seven all the way down to verse 12. So Paul is what Dr. Porter suggests is the same suggestion and argument 
that I've been making, he just says, says it in different words. He calls it a positive negative. Um, uh, he, he refers to it as a positive and a negation. I call it a positive negative pattern. But what I've been arguing is that Paul is moving, that Paul is moving believers away, especially the wealthy women. He's moving them away from disruptive, dishonorable behavior or vices, the negative, and he is seeking to move them towards honorable behavior or virtues. That's in alignment with, um, and, and it's the fruit of sound teaching. So the, the virtuous behavior is in alignment with and it's the fruit of sound teaching. And what I've said is, this is what Paul is moving them towards. Now, I just had it reversed. I had it, I was constantly saying, he's moving them away from the negative behavior to, or the dishonorable behavior, the disruptive behavior to the honorable virtuous behavior. But it's the same thing. It's, you've got the positive, you've got the negation. You've got moving away from and moving towards something. And this is what we also see in chapter 11 and verse 12. Let the women learn with all silence and submission. We said before that this is these are virtues within the first century world. They are to learn. That is positive. What's the negation? The negation is, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Okay? So 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 is using the same positive-negative pattern. If we are consistent... Paul has been doing this all the way down, and when he gets to 11 and 12, he is still making that argument, utilizing that pattern, okay? So again, in verse 12, we have the negation. Uh, and if, if we're consistent in our exegesis, the teaching here would be negative, a false teaching, not positive, not positive, because he tells them not to teach. Because in every other negative that Paul cites from verses 8, down to verse 11 and 12, or let's say from 8, 9, and 10. Every negation is a negation that is negative. It is seen as a vice. It arises out of the false teaching. If we're going to be consistent, and for those of you been, that have been following this entire series, you remember one of my hermeneutical principles was that we must be consistent in our exegesis. We must be consistent in our interpretation. If we are consistent, then we see that in verse 8, Paul says, lift up holy hands, positive. Do away with uh, arguing and disputing. That's a negative. Paul says, women, dress appropriately. Dress in ways that show your godliness. That's the positive. Do not put on ostentatious, expensive clothing because that is a vice. That's a negative. Okay, And these things arise and are motivated by the false teaching. Let a woman learn. This is in keeping with sound doctrine, but do not teach. Uh, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. If we are consistent, the negation is also a negation that is due to false teaching. That's what Paul is prohibiting, prohibiting here is false teaching. And we're going to see in just a moment, this also applies to the authority. So Paul in the verses above, and Paul in, in, in the verses above chapter 2, verse 12, and Paul in the verses below chapter 2, verse 12, going into chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, Paul never prohibits what is in alignment with sound teaching or reflects sound teaching. If chapter 2, verse 12, if the teaching of the women in chapter 2, verse 12, refers to apostolic public teaching, what Paul calls sound teaching, now the two are not really the same, but if, if, if Paul is talking about teaching good doctrine, right doctrine, he never prohibits what is good and right. He only prohibits what is out of alignment with sound doctrine. And so he could not, in chapter 2, verse 12, in my opinion, he could not be talking about sound teaching, or as complementarians have said, apostolic public teaching that occurs within churches. I, I, I just, when you start looking at the pattern, as Dr. Porter has pointed out, and as I said, Paul's been moving them away from what is uh, negative to what is positive. He is moving them towards the positive and telling them to learn, but in telling them to not teach and exercise authority, he is talking about what is negative, okay? Paul is, again, moving towards what is honorable and virtuous. He's moving them away from what is dishonorable and, dis and disruptive, um, a vice, what is dishonorable and disruptive is a vice that's caused by the false teachings, okay? So I'm saying this in context of the teaching, some more to augment what I said last week. So thank you, Dr. Stanley Porter. All right, 
Let's talk about authority. Authority in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. What does it mean? The verse, uh, the, uh, in the, the, the term, I should say, in chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, this is New King James, but to be in silence. The word authority, the term authority, is what is known as a hapax legomenon. And this simply means hapax legomenon, legomen, legomenon, <laughs> oh, hard, hard thing to say any word. This means that it's only used once, it's only said once, used once in the New Testament. Hapax legomenon literally means it's Greek for said once. So this term authority that's used is only used one time in the entirety of the Bible. It's only used one time. And, and that's in Paul here in chapter 2, verse 12. It's not even used in the Septuagint. It's only used by Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. Now, does this word mean, and this is this is the big debate and discussion where it comes to egalitarians and complementarians. Does this word mean to have authority in a positive or a neutral sense, just to have authority? Mike Winger believes that the term translated as authority means to have authority or to come into a position of authority. Um, and I get this from Mike's notes on from his uh, um, message, Women in Ministry, Part 12, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 15. So what I'm getting ready to say in reference to Mike comes from his notes, which I he, he provided freely. Thank you, Mike. And I was able to download. So Mike believes that the term translated as authority, the term is often teo um, in Greek. He believes that it means to have authority or to come into a position of authority. So Mike connects this authority with being an elder and, the author and, and with the authority of an elder. He writes in his notes, he says, quote, in the immediate First Timothy context of eldership, in telling those things specifically, I think we can fairly see that teaching is in relation to authority, okay? So he sees First Timothy within the context of the eldership that Paul begins to speak of in chapter three. So he believes that since chapter three speaks of teaching, so it talks about an elder being apt to teach. And, it, and then chapter three talks about an elder must rule his household or else how can he take care of the church of God? So I imagine that this is where Mike has seen the concept of authority that in, in he connects this teaching and authority of chapter three with the words teaching and authority in chapter two. He sees the theme of teaching and authority in chapter three. He connects it back to chapter two. He says, hey, look, chapter two is mentioning teaching and authority. We see these themes in chapter three. So he sees chapter two as permitting, prohibiting women from functioning as, in the position and with the authority of an elder. Okay. Uh, he says, in terms of a woman teaching, this is what Mike states, quote, if a woman wants to teach in some way, that doesn't relate to church authority, it's a different issue, end quote. And again, he says that uh, that's consistent with 1 Timothy 2 being a precursor to discussing who can be an elder. All right, so I read that to say that Mike sees authority here as positive. He sees it as speaking of the authority that a pastor or an elder has in a church and that Paul denies this to a woman. Now, again, keep in mind Mike's thinking. He sees chapter 2, verse 12 as a precursor to chapter 3. In chapter 3, we have themes, we have the, the, the concept of the elder, and we have themes of teaching. An elder must be apt to teach. If an elder is going to uh, uh, serve the church of God, he must be able to rule his household. An elder has authority. So Mike sees that in chapter 3, we have themes of authority and teaching, and this is what we see in chapter 2. So chapter 2, and, and Mike is one compliment, uh, complementarian among many who sees chapter 2 verse 12 as saying hey this is talking about pastoral leadership or pastoral authority or the authority in the positions of elders and this paul says is prohibited uh to women only men are to have this authority okay so this is how mike and complementarians see this so mike sees it as a positive he sees it as speaking of the authority that a pastor or an elder has in a church and that Paul denies this to women, all right? And he sees chapter two, verse 12 as a precursor. That's his words in his notes, as a precursor to what is coming in chapter three when Paul starts to talk about elders. Now, with that being said, this is problematic. The interpretation that Mike lays out is problematic. Now, let me say this, because I, I need to say this real quick. I am not going to cover in this session 
all of the different things that have been said about often often tail or often time we would be here for hours and days if i try to cover all of this what i'm going to cover are the conclusions what i'm going to do is go and do a separate teaching and i will post it where i will deal with what mike has said about often because uh, he did in the he did a video that's I think the, the I'm not sure how long the authentio part is on authority, uh, but it's very long. The, the, the video is 11.5 hours. I'm about three hours into it. So I got another, what, eight hours to go, eight and a half hours to go. Uh, but I did go look at his notes. So I'm going to do a separate teaching where I deal with what he has said and offer my views on what he has said and, and where I think he's made some mistakes. Okay. But I'm going to cover the conclusions here and offer what why I believe that what Mike is saying, that this is referring to the authority of an elder or authority of a pastor, why this is incorrect, right? So here it is. If Paul is, is if Paul in chapter 2, verse 12, is saying that women are not allowed to have the authority of a pastor or the or and they're not allowed to function in the position of a pastor, the position of an elder, or that authority. That's problematic because, number one, let me say this, Paul never, up until this point, mentions pastors or elders. Paul never mentions pastors. He never mentions elders in chapter one. Keep in mind what the book of Timothy is about. What did Paul tell Timothy? I left you in Ephesus to do what? To, to tell or to charge or to command certain ones, literally in the Greek, to command certain ones not to teach other doctrine, hetero. Uh, hetero didastomy, to, to teach other teachings. He's dealing with false teaching. He's, I left you there to deal with those who are, who are espousing false teaching. What complementarians are saying is that the women are teaching apostolic doctrine. And as I said before, Paul never says, I want you, Timothy, to stop the women from teaching apostolic doctrine. And Paul never mentions in chapter one anything about elders. He never mentions anything about women trying to take on the role of elders and trying to take on the role of pastors. He never mentions that. He doesn't mention it in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. When we get to chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, I do not allow women to teach or to have authority over a man. Paul, if, if Paul is talking about in chapter 2, verse 12, pastoral authority or the authority of an elder, then Paul is bringing up a subject out of the blue that he has not mentioned up until this point. There is nothing to indicate that women having pastoral authority uh, is what Paul has talked about. There's nothing that precedes this in chapter 1, on chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. There's nothing to proceed to indicate that Paul is getting ready to talk about how it is problematic that women in the church are trying to step into uh, apostolic, uh, I mean, not apostolic, but pastoral authority or trying to step into the role and the authority of elders. There is nothing in chapter one or in chapter two, verses one through 11, that even speaks to this. There's nothing. There is no antecedent. There is nothing that, there's no indicators of this preceding chapter two and verse 12. And there is nothing that indicates that this is a problem in the Ephesus church. Nothing. Mike says chapter 2, verse 12 is a precursor to chapter 3 and who can be an elder. Again, this is problematic because Mike says that because chapter 2 speaks of teaching and authority and chapter 3 carries this theme, carries the theme of teaching and authority, though often Teo is never used in chapter 3 or in the rest of the chapters. Mike, so he believes that chapter 2, verse 12 is therefore a precursor because chapter 2, verse 12 speaks of uh, teaching and authority and chapter three has themes of teaching and authority paul actually uses the word teach but he never uses the word authority but he, he speaks to it so mike believes well chapter three therefore is a precursor to chapter two but to assert this you have to go to chapter three read it and then read the theme of elder leadership and authority back into chapter two and verse 12. in order for mike to make this argument you have to move past chapter two, go into chapter three, read about how elders, who can be an elders, what are the qualifications and the qualities and the characteristics of an elder, then turn back to chapter two and read eldership and, a, and the authority of an elder back into chapter two, 
verse 12. You're moving ahead and then reading it back into chapter two, verse 12, where if we start at chapter one and read all the way down, there is no indication that Paul is telling Timothy, you got to deal with these women who are trying to move into the position of elders and pastors and trying to take on that authority. There is no indication of that. You have to go to chapter three and read about elders or pastors, as some say, though the word pastor is not used. Then you have to read that back. Excuse me. You have to read that back into chapter two and verse 12. And that, in my opinion, is bad exegesis. It is poor exegesis. I'm going forward taking the theme of chapter three, taking the theme of chapter three about elders and reading that back into chapter two, when chapter two says nothing about elders. It doesn't even mention, it's not talking about elders, it's talking about the behavior of the women, but it never mentions pastoral authority, it never mentions elders, it never mentions their authority. Mike gets that because he's read chapter, and other complementarians, because they've read chapter three, and they've read the themes of teaching and authority, and they go, oh, chapter two talks about that, so it must be the same thing. No, if we read the context from chapter one all the way down, especially when we get into chapter two, it is talking about the disruptive, dishonorable behavior of the wealthy women at Ephesus, as we have shown through, uh, as when I started this series about eight lessons ago, okay? So again, um, this is poor exegesis to do this way. As we said, chapter one, chapter two, nothing suggests that women, uh, that, 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 that there is a problem with women trying to take on pastoral authority and leadership. There is nothing to suggest that. And there is nothing after chapter two to suggest that false teaching is creating women teachers who are teaching good, sound apostolic doctrine and doing it in such a way as to sound like an elder. One of the things that Mike says is, well, it's okay for women to teach as long as they don't sound like an elder. Which I go, how, how, what does an elder sound like? How do you not sound authoritative like an elder? That to me is just impossible to try to quantify and to give some standards for it. As long as you don't sound, I think even in his last message, he says, as long as they're writing and they're not speaking and writing like an elder, how do you read, write, how do you read and speak, or how do you write and speak like an elder? We're given no instructions where that is concerned in the church. In my opinion, that's something we're just making up now. We're just making up things to say a woman can speak as long as she doesn't sound like an elder. No, she can speak on a Wednesday night or she can speak, but as long as she doesn't sound like an elder. Number one, the text doesn't say that. Number two, what does an elder sound like? <laughs> what, does a, what does the authority of an elder sound like? I've heard many different elders and none of them sound exactly the same, okay? So I'm not trying to make fun here. I'm trying to bring some reasoning to this and that does not seem to be reasonable. And again, as we said with teaching, when you look at when, what Paul is talking about, the false teaching, as you read what he says in chapter one about false teaching, as we go into chapter two, as we go into chapter three about false teaching, as we did, we looked at chapter uh, three and four and five, nowhere does Paul say, yes, and one of the problems that this false teaching is causing is women rising up taking on apostolic, excuse me, not apostolic, taking on pastoral authority, assuming the role of an elder, and they're teaching good biblical apostolic doctrine. That is not portrayed as a problem in chapters three, four, or five. Paul does talk about the problems of the false teaching. It causes envy. It causes disputes. It causes arguments. But he never says, and yes, it causes women to start to teach good sound apostolic doctrine as if they themselves are elders or, the, and, or they're assuming the position of elders. He never states that as a problem. He never states that. So the evidence, in my opinion, is not there to say that 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, when it says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority, that authority is not speaking about the pastoral authority. It's not speaking about leadership authority um, in terms of being a pastor or an elder. It is not speaking about that at all. So how do we interpret authority? How do we interpret authentio in this passage. As I said, I'm not going to go because I'm not going to go to all the arguments. There have been tons of ink spilled talking about what authentio is. There's so many uh, studies. Now, when I do do a more direct uh, critique of Mike's teaching on this, Mike Winger's teaching on this, I will go into more of that research. 
I'm not going to do it here because it would just take too much time, but I'm going to give you the conclusions of where, where people basically are in the egalitarian and complementarian. So Dr. Stanley Porter states concerning the term um, authority or often tail, there are two major interpretations. Now, again, there are other in, there are other interpretations, but these are the two major ones. Number one, to exercise authority in a non-pejorative way, in a neutral sense or a positive sense. This is the sense that Mike takes it and other complementarians, or it can mean to exercise authority in an abusive way, in a negative sense. This is how uh, most, if not all, but I would say at least most egalitarians take it, that the authority here is not a positive authority. The authority here is an abusive authority. It's a negative authority. Um, so most, if not all complementarians, like Mike Winger, they settle on meaning number one, is it, it, it is to exercise authority in a non-pejorative way or in a, or in a neutral way or in a positive sense. Uh, but again, I would suggest, and I would argue that number two, exercising authority in a in an abusive way, in a negative sense, that this is the context, that this best fits the context of chapter two, verses nine through 12. That, that often tail is speaking of, or sometimes often tank, that it's speaking of utilizing, uh, exercising authority in an abusive, domineering, negative manner. This best fits the context of chapter two, verses nine through 12, in my opinion. Remember, as we said earlier, that this verse, chapter two, verse 12, is a part of Paul's positive negative or part of his positive negation pattern. And we said that earlier, right? This is highlighted by Dr. Porter. We said before, the positive is let a woman learn in quietness or in silence without being disruptive, without, uh, and, and they are to listen with respect. We've covered this before when we talked about Hezekiah. So this is a positive, this is a virtue for a woman to be uh, silent, for a woman to learn in silence, for a student to learn in silence. This was considered a virtue. This was a positive in the ancient Greco-Roman world. Again, we have a whole teaching on Hezekiah. Go back, find it, listen to it. So this is seen as a positive. Let a woman learn in quietness and with self-restraint or control, which is how I'm interpreting uh, submission here, which I got from Mark Moscow, Moscow, uh, Moscow, um, uh, Moscow uh, that this is how this should be interpreted, that it's talking about her exercising restraint over herself. So she's learning with respect towards the teacher She's not interrupting the teacher. She's being quiet. She's listening to what the teacher has to say. This is a positive. This is a virtue in the first century Greco-Roman world. So this is the positive, right? What's the negation? I do not allow women to teach. Teach what? False doctrine, nor to exercise abusive authority or to be domineering over a man. And this is a possible definition of this term. We've already shown that the teaching is a false teaching, so therefore it's a negative. Domineering or, or ruling over a man in the first century world would be seen as a negative. My argument is that Paul here is, is utilizing this as a negative. Teaching and having authority over man or being a, uh, having abusive authority or domineering a man, Paul is seeing the, the often tale as a negative here. Because in the first century world, in the first century world, their culture, for a woman to rule over a man was seen as a negative. Let me give you some quotes here. Brian J. Robinson in his book, Being Subordinate Man, he says, a woman who seeks to dominate a household is portrayed as introducing chaos and threatening the empire. Threatening the empire. Who is this? A woman who seeks to dominate, to be in control of the household. Then uh, this is from, that's page 47 of his book, Being Subordinate Men. Very interesting book. Uh, there is a work by uh, Kali Kratidis uh, or pseudo Kali Kratidis, and it says this. Uh, got my glasses so I can see. And this is from a work known as On the Happiness of Household. Quote Those who marry a woman above their condition, meaning their financial and social status. So, those who marry a woman who's above them in terms of financial status, in terms of social status, they have to contend for the mastership. So a man who marries a woman who is above his financial and social status has to contend with that woman for with that woman for the mastership. Quote, for the wife surpassing the husband in wealth and lineage wishes to rule over him. 
but he considers it to be unworthy of him and preternatural, meaning beyond what is normal or natural. He doesn't consider it to be normal or natural to submit to his wife. So for his wife to rule over him and for him to submit to his wife, he doesn't consider it to be normal or natural. And that's from On the Happiness of Household, as quoted in David L. Box, Let Women Be Submissive. That's from this book here. Be, oop, my, my life won't be able to say, there, okay, there we go. Uh, so that's from this book here. Now, so already we're seeing that for a woman, now he's talking about wives, but this, if you do the research, you can see it's also speaking of women in general. Women, men were supposed to rule in the Greco Roman world, not the women. Men rule as a rule. Well, the norm was men rule and women submit to them, and women do not rule over men. That was the norm. There were exceptions, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Okay, uh, another quote from a guy named Marshall, who is a Roman poet. He says, you all ask why I don't want to marry a rich wife. I love this. I don't. Why does he want to marry a rich wife? I don't want to be my wife's wife. <laughs> the matron should be below her husband. That's the only way man and woman can be equal. Wow, what a quote. So he says, you ask, why don't I want to marry a woman who's rich, who's richer than me, because I don't want to be my wife's wife. Meaning what? I don't want to be subordinate to her. If I marry a woman who's more rich than me, she has more social status, I'm going to be subordinate. I'm going to be in submission to her. He said the matron should be below her husband. The woman is supposed to be below the husband. That's the only way man and woman could be equal. So his view of equal is if, if the woman is below the husband, then we're equal. All right. So again, the idea, it's a negative for a woman to rule over a man. And this is quoted in the book, Women in the New Testament World by Susan Hyland. I always like to show you the books that I'm dealing with. So that's this book here, Women in the New Testament World. Can you see that? No, nope, so much light. So Women in the New Testament World by Susan Hyland. Wonderful book. I've quoted from this before. Okay. And so in the Greco-Roman world, again, it was the norm for men to rule and for women to be submitted to this rule. That was the norm. But there could be exceptions to this based on the wealth and status of the woman in relation to a man or in relation to her husband. And we've seen this from the quotes above. If you had a woman who, because in the Greco-Roman world, a woman could come into a marriage and she could have money of her own that she got from her father. She could have an inheritance that was her own that she got from her father. And she could be richer than her husband. She could have, because of her family, she could have higher social status than her husband. And if that was the case, as uh, it, as it was said here, a woman uh, by uh, pseudo uh, Callicritus, if, if she surpasses the husband in wealth and lineage, she wishes to rule over him. Now, are you starting to see the connection to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12? Okay. Su um, Susan Highland writes from... Um, women in the New Testament world, not all women were viewed as inferior to all men. Women with greater wealth or excellent lineage had higher status than men from humble origins. So men of humble origin or women of, of wealth and lineage had higher social status, more influence, more power than men from humbler, from humble origins. But as a rule, women ruling over men was seen as a negative. It would bring dishonor or shame to the man. It would bring dishonor and shame to his household. If he was part of a community, as we said before, the honor of a man was impacted by his wife. So if she's ruling over him, it's going to impact him. It's going to impact his household. It's going to impact the community that he is a part of. And again, that it brings shame and dishonor. We see this in, in Marshall's quote. He doesn't want to be his wife's wife. That is, he doesn't want to be in the subordinate position. As we shared before in earlier messages, the first century Greco-Roman world, in terms of what makes a man a man, was about control and dominance. A man was a man if he was in control, if he was contro in control of his body, if he was control of his wife, if he was in control of his household, that he was a man and that brought him honor. If he was controlled by someone else, if he was controlled by his wife, he loses his masculinity in the Greco-Roman world, this is the belief, and he loses his honor. He becomes shamed. So for a woman to rule over a man was to bring the man into shame, all right? So let's go back now to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. 
as we said before, because remember, the idea here is that wealthy women could have more honor and social power and status than men. What does chapter 2, verse 9 say? In like manner, also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. As we established, this, these are the adornments of wealthy women. As I've said, these women here in chapter 2, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, Paul is not speaking to all women in general. He is speaking to wealthy women. That's who he's speaking to. Okay? So, um, so the women here are wealthy women. Now, notice that in, in the quotes that I shared with you before, that the wealthy women are said to seek to rule or master their husbands. Now, this is significant. The reason this is significant is because of how the wealthy, whether they were men or women, male or female, the wealthy were viewed a certain way. How were the wealthy viewed within the first century world? Let me read to you from a book called On Rhetoric. On Rhetoric, oh, that one, you can see that one. On Rhetoric, this is by Aristotle, who was a philosopher. And this is what Aristotle had to say about the wealthy. This is from page 170. This is from a book two, chapter 16, character as affected by wealth. He says, quote, the kind of character that follow from wealth are plain for all to see. For the wealthy are insolent and arrogant. Hold on for just one moment. Notice he says the wealthy are insolent and arrogant. They're prideful, right? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's look at verse 17. What does Paul command the wealthy? Command those who are rich in this world and or rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches. They're not to be haughty. They're not to be arrogant. Why does Paul say this? Because as Aristotle says, that the kind of character that follow from wealth are plain for all to see. The wealthy are insolent and they are arrogant, being affected somehow by the possession of wealth. For their state of mind is that is that of those who have all good things. He goes on to say, another result of wealth is that the rich think they deserve to rule. For they think they have that which makes one worthy to rule. And what is it? Money or wealth. Let me read to you again what Aristotle said. Another result of wealth is that the rich think they deserve to rule. For they think they have that which makes one worthy to rule. That is money. So one of the problems of the wealthy, especially within the first century world, within the Greco-Roman world, is that they believe because of their wealth, their wealth, they deserve to rule. All right. Uh, Jerome Nere, in this book here, which I've quoted from, Honor and Shame in the Gospel of Matthew, this is what he says. He says, quote, wealth, moreover, easily translates into power. It's claim for its possessors, it claims for its possessors respect and worth as powerful persons who act as patrons to others and who deserve to rule. So again, Nehre is confirming this, that those who are wealthy, they act as patrons. I'm going to explain what patrons are in just a moment. And they believe that they deserve to rule. So the attitude of those who are wealthy and who act as patrons or benefactors and a patron is one who provides resources to others, they believe that they have the right to rule others. Let me read to you from another book called Struggles for Power in Early Christianity by Elsa Tamez. And this is what she has to say about, and she's talking about 1 Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I hope you're following along with me thus far. So what we're saying up to this point is this. Those who are wealthy... According to Aristotle, according to um, uh, others, uh, uh, um, who was a pseudo, uh, who was a pseudo Cali uh, Crititis, they believe that those who are rich, they believe the they say that those who are rich believe that they deserve to rule because they are patrons and they gift and they provide resources for others who are in need, who have less than them. They believe that they can rule them. Okay, let me read to you. Um, Actually, before I read this, let me read to you from Dr. Cindy Westfall, Paul and Gender, one of my favorite books. Let me read to you what she has to say about the wealthy. She says, quote, many outside of the debate assume that authenteo is a technical term for being a pastor. Since 
It is the primary justification for excluding women from the also office of pastor. Oh, wait a minute, hang on. No, I don't want to read this yet. I'm sorry. I do. I want to read to you. Struggles of I'm going to read that one once. So let me read to you again what was said by uh, Elsa Tamez about, um, about the rich. She says on page seven, starting on page seven, we think that the problem that provokes the letter, First Timothy, is caused neither by women in general, as I've been arguing, although yes, the author reaction to women is very negative, nor is it caused by the presence of rich women and men but the problem is the is the problem is the power and the influence that both these elements together have over the community. The problem is the power and influence that both these elements together have over the community. What is the elements? Rich women who have power and influence. Okay. She goes on to say. Um, the text, although directed toward the women of the community, focuses on rich women. That is what I've been arguing. And she's talking about 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through verse 12. The prohibition implies that these women are teaching in the church, which was common in the early Christian communities. But for some reason, this exhortation demands stopping this practice. That is, the author does not want women to continue teaching. The motives can be linked to the problem of what the author considers to be teachings foreign to the gospel which suppose that these women find these teachings appealing and are sharing them with other women, as we will see in the third chapter. She says, we think, though, that above all, the prohibition of chapter 2, verse 12, is the result of the strong influence of these rich and powerful women over the whole community. The issue was that some women were well off, and because of the patronage system, were socially above the men. The honor of these women, according to the parameters of Greco-Roman society, was above both men and women of lesser means. So if you were rich, you were socially, uh, in terms of status and power, you were above those who had less than you, okay? The, uh, the affirmation not to dominate or exercise authority is highly significant in this context. It does not, now she says, it does not refer to husbands. There are egalitarians who are in... in uh, not in agreement where this is concerned. Some say it does refer to husbands. Some say that it doesn't. If you remember, I've been saying men and or husbands to cover both sides because my interpretation of this text, if it's husbands they're talking to, I believe my, my interpretation covers it. If it's not husbands, just the men in the assembly, my, interpret my interpretation of this passage still stands. It doesn't change depending on who the men are. But she goes on to say, it does not refer to husbands, as we said above, but to men in general. But the tensions referred to in the text, we believe, uh, excuse me, by the tensions referred to in the text, we believe that the author has in mind particularly the male leaders of the community. And in her view, these male leaders are probably, they probably have less money, less prestige, less social status than the rich women. Because Ephesus, Ephesus did have rich men and women. Ephesus was a very wealth, wealthy town, but there was poor people. We know that there were slaves in Ephesus. Now, some slaves could be wealthy, but these women who are teaching are, are as we said, the, these are wealthy women because of their adorn, adornment. We find ourselves then with a struggle for power between the rich women who teach without being officially named and the male leadership. The author of the letter sends instructions to remove the rich women from leadership position, or as Paul says, that he is he does not want them to teach and to have authority over men, meaning he wants them to stop uh, being dominant, domineering over the men. Okay, let me go on. To, uh, I forgot to read the rest of this. All right, she goes on to say, um, okay, one explanation for the powerful influence of wealthy men and women in the early Christian community is what is called the patronage system, which tied the relationship of those who had less with those who had more. This system is key for understanding the preeminence of certain women and, cert and certain men in the Ephesian community. The system of patronage, also called a, sy a system of benefactors, consisted, consisted of an exchange of relationship between those of unequal means. But what could also happen with those of equal means. When a rich and powerful person gave a favor and protection to another person of an inferior status, a permanent relationship was established between patron and client. 
the patron, the one who's giving, the one who's called the benefactor, gave what the other needed, and the one who received had to compensate in some way for the favor received. Generally, people repaid the favor, rewarding the persons who did the favor by praising their generosity. Okay, let me read you a couple more things, and then we'll move on from here. Um, it is logical to suppose, this is from page 11, it is logical to suppose that the influence of the patronage system so common and familiar in all of the Roman Empire was very strong in the Christian communities. For example, a man or a woman, uh, for example, a man or woman head of a wealthy family who would offer his or her house to the community would be considered a patron and very probably expected to be recompensed in some way by other members. And because the patronage system was contrary to the gospel's principles of equality, conflicts with rich men and women would not have been surprising. So one of the difficulties that we are facing with, and one of the things going on here is that you've got this patronage system that is operating even within the church. You have rich women, rich men. The rich women are probably giving funds to the community. They are maybe providing their households for the people to meet in, and they expect to exercise authority. They expect because the wealthy expect to rule. Now, let me, um, what do I want to go from here? Um, let me read to you from Dr. Cindy Westfall. I'm going to read to you what I started to read before. She also speaks to this. So going back to her again, this is from Paul and Gender, page 291 and page 292. Many outside of the debate assume that often tail, translated as authority, is a technical term for being a pastor. This is how Mike Winger, this is how many complementarians interpret authentail, that it refers to pastoral leadership, pastoral authority, a pastoral office. Dr. Westfall says, many outside of the debate assume that authentail is a technical term for being a pastor since it is the primary justification for excluding women from the office of pastor and from other leadership over men. However, out of the over 300 occurrences of the verb, in the TLG database, this is a database you can use to find Greek words, no one has identified a case where it refers to any kind of benevolent pastoral care of an individual or group by a pastor or church official. There is no example of a male doing, doing this to another person or a group of people in a ministry or church leadership context where the referring action had a positive evaluation in the context. So what she's basically saying is, when we, she looks at over the 300 occurrences of this term, authentio, and probably its cognates, the, the, the derivations of the word, none of them are used within the context of ministry. None of them are used within the context of being a pastor. We do not find in, the, in the, over 300 occurrences, it's not there. She goes on to say, the people who are the targets, excuse me, in, in the Greek corpus, the verb authentio refers to a range of actions that are not restricted to murder or violence. However, the people who are the targets of these actions are harmed, forced against their will, compelled, or at least their self-interest is overridden because the action involves the imposition of the subject's will over against the recipient will, ranging from dishonor to lethal force. Let me break down again what she's saying. She's saying when we look at people who are having authority exercise over them or they are being they're being often tamed we'll put it like this okay they're being often tamed someone is exercising authority over them she says people who are the targets of these action the recipients of the action they are harmed or they're forced against their will or compelled to do something they don't want to do or their own self-interest what they want gets overridden or um the actions of the person who is exercising the authority is exercising their will over against another person. And this could cause one of the actions that can happen is the person who is being often tamed, the person whose whose will is being overridden, they get they get dishonored. This is one of the results of being often tamed, to have authority exercised against you. I hope I'm using that correctly, but if not, uh, the person who's had the authority exercised against them, they are being one of the actions is they are being dishonored. So this is what Dr. Cindy Westfall, Dr. Cynthia Westfall, this is what she has found in her research. Whenever this word is used in relation to another human being, it is never positive. It is negative. 
they're not on the receiving end of something positive. They're on the receiving end of something negative. Okay. Um, let me read to you one more thing she said. I forgot. Page 308. One more thing that she said here. I think this is what I was supposed to read. Yeah. She says on page... Um, that's what I was supposed to read. She said... Um, If widows and wives were healthy through inheritance, role reversal could be a real and present experience. Aristotle described such an exception where the wife would rule the household because of her inheritance, which gave her power. Sometimes, however, women rule, the, oh, excuse me, this is a quote from Aristotle, quote, sometimes, however, women rule because they are heiresses. Their rule is thus not in accordance with virtue, but due to wealth and power as in oligarchies. Let me read that again. Their rule, the rule of women, is thus not in accordance with the virtue, but is due. It's the result of wealth and power, as in all oligarchies. However, this was definitely not the cultural idea, and it had the potential of embarrassing or shaming the husbands and the church in the society. Dr. Westfall sees when it talks about, I do not allow a woman to exercise or to have authority over men. She sees this as referring to husbands and wives. Tamez, Elsa Tamez does not see it that way. Some people see it that way in the egalitarian world. Some scholars do not, okay? But again, though, as I said, my interpretation is not dependent upon whether or not it's husbands or just men in general, because here's the idea. The idea here is that women with wealth seek, women with wealth, wealth seek to rule, and Aristotle states that their rule is not due to virtue, but to wealth and power. Now, Jesus spoke against this type of rule through wealth. We're almost finished here. Jesus spoke of the, against the type of rule that happens through wealth. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. So what I'm arguing is that the way often tale is used in second, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12 is that it is used to speak of those who have wealth and they're and they have high they have wealth they have high status they have power they're probably patrons of the members of the community and they expect to rule and they are exercising we could say an illegitimate rule against the people in the fellowship they are exercising an abusive domineering uh and dominating rule and this type of rule rule through wealth because you think you're because you're wealthy, you think you have the right to rule. This was the mindset of the wealthy within the first century. Jesus speaks against this. So in Luke chapter 22, it says, uh, the disciples were arguing about who would be the greatest among them. And this is what Jesus said. Now listen very carefully. The kings of the Gentile exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. Ah, oh, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those who exercise authority and the word authority here is used in a negative sense. They are called benefactors. They are patrons, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not, is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I'm among you as the one who serves. So Jesus here is literally saying that in the Greco-Roman world, those who are rich, those who are benefactors, expect to rule. He's confirming what Aristotle said. He, Jesus, uh, he was confirming. What I mean confirming, I'm, I'm not saying that Jesus is like, hey, Aristotle says this and he's right. What I'm saying is Jesus confirms what we know of the first century world and how the rich thought. This is what Aristotle said. Dr. Craig Evans, in an article called King Jesus and His Ambassadors from a book called Empire in the New Testament, this is what he says about this passage. He says, Luke's readers would readily interpret the reference to benefactors in the context of rulers and the mighty, the very people who lorded over others, defining their tyrannical rule with the euphemism benefaction. Now, benefaction sounds nice, but it covered really what they were doing. They were being tyrants. Luke's, going back to Dr. Craig Evans, quote, Luke's readers knew 
that the epitaph benefactor was commonly bestowed on gods, kings, and wealthy, powerful men who contributed to society. Wealthy women in the first century, by the way, could also be called patrons or benefactors. What Dr. Craig Evans is saying is that Luke's readers, when they heard this, they would know that their benefaction was actually a tyrannical rule, that those who gave, those who acted as patrons expected to rule, and their rule was ty tyrannical. Their rule was authoritarian. Their rule was domineering. It was not a positive rule. It was a negative. This is why Jesus said, this is not to happen among you. Now, he doesn't use the word often tame. He uses a word that has to do with lording it over others. But, it, but, but my point here is just like Aristotle said, as quoted by Dr. Uh, Cynthia Westfall and some other quotes I gave you, the rich expect to rule. They believe they have the right to rule because they are benefactors. And this rule is negative. And Aristotle said, women who inherit their monies and they have more than their husbands, they dominate, they rule over their husbands. And this is negative, not positive. So Jesus confirms what Aristotle wrote, those who are rich seek to rule over eat, over others. And Jesus forbids this type of domineering, authoritarian, lording it over others rule that people were practicing in the first century. This is also what Paul is prohibiting. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter two. This is what Paul is prohibiting. When Paul says to the wealthy women, this is why I've been so careful to constantly say Paul is talking to wealthy women. He's telling the wealthy women, you do not have the right to rule simply because you've given, simply because you've been a patron, simply because according to Greco-Roman standards, you have a higher status. You don't have the right to rule or to teach. So what Paul is talking about here is not a benevolent pastoral servant leadership when he uses the word authentio. Again, going back to, and I'm, I've already read it, but uh, going back to just real quick, let me read to you what Dr. Cynthia Westfall said. I read this by accident. I was supposed to read it last. Um, this is on page 291. I just want to read real quick what she said before. You can go back to the quote I said earlier. But on 291, she says, many outside of the debate assume that authentio is a technical term for being a pastor since it is the primary justification for excluding women from the office of pastor and from other leadership of men. However, out of the over 300 occurrences of the verb in the TLG database, no one has identified a case where it refers to any kind of benevolent pastoral care of any individual or group by a pastor or a church official. She goes on to say again, that when people are, when, when this term is used, authentio, it is used to the detriment of other human beings. When a human being is exercising authentio to, towards another human being, it is detrimental. It is not positive, it is negative. This fits in with all of the evidence that I've shared with you up to this point. We see Paul using a positive, negative pattern. When he gets to, chap when he gets to verse 11 of, and 12 of chapter two, he is still using the positive, negative pattern. Women are to learn, they are to learn respectfully. They are to learn with self-control. These are all positive virtues that they are to do. What's the negation? They are not to teach and they are not to exercise this dominating authority. This is a negative, not a positive, if we follow Paul's pattern and we are consistent in our interpretation. So this behavior was forbidden by Jesus and by Paul. Go over to first. Uh, go over to First Timothy chapter 6. I want to show you something. Now, what did, we just read Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, right? He says that um, those uh, that the benefactors in the Greco-Roman world, they lorded over others, but it's not to be so among you. That's the teaching of Jesus. Paul is echoing this teaching. How do I know that? Look at First Timothy chapter 6. This is how I would argue this. I want to suggest that Paul is uh, echoing the teachings of Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If anyone teach otherwise, this is the false teaching, and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes 
arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourselves. Why do I read that? Notice Paul says here in verse three, if you teach otherwise, if you teach false teaching and you're not holding to and teaching the words of the Lord Jesus, what do you enter into? Disputes, arguing, railings. This is the fruit of the false teaching. If you're following this false teaching, you're going to seek to teach this false teaching, which will bring you into disputes with others. And you're seeking to rule over men, which is going to bring you into dispute with the men or with the male teachers who probably are on a lower socioeconomic scale than the women who were rich. This, I believe, and I would argue, is what Paul means by authentic, authentic both by in terms of the meaning of the word when you when you look it up and you, and you look at the research that scholars have done that the word can mean to dominate it can mean to domineer but also when we look at the viewpoint of how wealthy people were seen they expected to rule when jesus said that those who are called benefactors they have a tyrannical rule and this is not to be among you and paul says we're to follow the words of the lord jesus and the lord jesus taught do not be a tyrannical ruler don't dominate others serve them and this is why paul is prohibiting the women who have embraced this false teaching and who've got into this domineering position and this domineering uh orientation towards the people in the fellowship and probably towards other men dr westfall would argue that it's towards also their husbands i say it could be because it probably is extending outside of the church this is what's going on and paul doesn't want this to happen because remember the greco-roman world is watching if you've got women dominating the men, this is going to look bad to Rome. Now, keep this in mind, as Dr. Westfall says in her book, no one is supposed to be engaging in this type of, of authority. Jesus taught that no one is supposed to be dominating. When Jesus taught this in Luke chapter 22, he said, it's not to be among you. Who? His disciples, his followers. So men are not supposed to be authentic their wives. In other words, they're not supposed to be dominating. They're not supposed to be um, uh, uh, what's what I want to use? Dominating uh, and being authoritarian and being um, domineering. They're not supposed to do that. No believer. We're supposed to follow the example of Jesus who said, I am one among you as he who serves. I'm among you as one who serves. That is our model. This is not what the women were doing. And no man who does this is supposed to be doing this constant fight as to who gets to be in charge? Who's the boss? Well, it's the men who are the boss. You're going contrary to the teachings of Jesus who says you are to be as one who serves. We're not supposed to be fighting for positions to rule over others. Okay? So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, Paul in, or excuse me, Paul in, in chapter 2, verse 12, when he says, I am not permitting a woman to teach or to uh exercise or to usurp or to domineer men, this is in agreement with the teachings of Jesus. It is not a positive authority. It is not a pastoral authority. It is not an elder position or authority. It is a negative exercise of power and influence that's based upon wealth. And Paul says it's not supposed to happen. And Jesus says it is not supposed to happen. Okay, one more thing and then we'll close. I got a question on YouTube. And the question was, why did not Paul name the women who are spreading the false teaching? He names the men. Uh, he talks about um, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom he has turned over to Satan, that they may learn not that they may learn to not blaspheme. And the question, I thought it was a good question. Why did Paul not name the women? Well, I believe it is because of a rhetorical strategy that Paul was using. What I'm going to share with you very quickly comes from, and I'm indebted to Dr. Lynn Kitson and her dissertation on the rhetorical strategies of the first chapter of First Timothy. She talks about this strategy that Paul is using. So in First Timothy chapter one, and we're going to close on this, verse three, it says, and I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Notice he says that you may charge some. Some translation says certain men. Some translations say I charge you to teach certain ones. In the Greek, it is uh, gender inclusive. It is not, it doesn't say certain men. It says certain ones. 
The Greek word is tis, which can mean men or women or anything or anyone. So Paul doesn't specifically say who he's talking about, but he, he mentions certain ones. And Dr. Lynn Kidson calls this, Kidson calls this a non-naming strategy, okay? Charge certain ones. Paul is utilizing, according to Dr. Kidson, a well-known rhetorical strategy called ins, uh, insuatio. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, insuatio. Now, it is applied to an introduction when one wants to use a subtle approach. When you want to use a subtle approach to try to reach people, you use in, insuatio, which is a subtle approach. It is an indirect approach to talking to someone rather than a direct approach. Let me give you an illustration. It's like if we were all sitting down with my family and the trash needs to be taken out. And my wife may look and go, oh man, this trash is getting full. This trash needs to be taken out. Now, what that means is if I'm sitting there, Mike, take out the trash, <laughs> okay? It's indirect, it's not direct. Direct would be Mike, take out the trash. But saying, oh, this trash needs to be taken out or car needs to be washed. What is that? Is an indirect way of saying, can you go wash the car? Paul is using this type of strategy. He's using an indirect way of communicating to the ones who are spreading this false teaching, okay? He utilizes a subtle approach. When do you utilize insinuatio? In, 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 in it is used on three occasions. When a case is discreditable, or that is when the subject under discussion will alienate the hearers from us. So if I'm going to talk about something that might cause you to be alienated from me, you're going to shut down. I'm going to use insuatio. When the hearers have already been won over by the previous speaker of the opposition. In other words, if you've already been won over by those that I'm against who have been speaking to you to false teaching, I might use insuatio in order to try to win you over. That's the second reason. Third reason, when the hearers have become weary by listening to the previous speakers. So those are, those are three reasons. I might use it if I think you are going to be alienated from me if I talk to you about this, this subject. If I if I approach you directly, you might shut down and not hear what I have to say. Or if I think, hmm, you've already been won over by my opponents, you've already been won over by this false teaching, I might use this indirect approach. Or if I think you've become weary by listening to previous speakers. Dr. Kitson says, in the context of 1 Timothy, the first two fit the circumstances the best. So Paul is going to use this rhetorical strategy because he doesn't want to alienate the rest of the people at Ephesus from, Ephesus from him. He wants them to listen. He doesn't want them to shut him out. And also, some of the, the, the wealthy women, they've already been won over by the false teachers, which is why they're spreading the teaching. So why do you take this approach? You take this approach because the audience was hostile. When You take this approach when the audience is hostile to the speaker. This is what Dr. Kitson says, quote, by using, by using uh, insinuation, the speaker hoped to bypass the listener's prejudice and ingratiate himself into their minds and heart. In the case of 1 Timothy's hearers, the primary problem is that some of the audience has been won over by pastoral Paul's opponents. If Paul were to use the direct approach, he would run the risk of creating hostility in his audience and they wouldn't hear him. His object is to win them over. His strategy is to reveal to his audience indirectly what he believes to be the truth of the matter. Certain ones are those in his, the certain ones or the, the certain ones that, he's, that he mentioned in, verse, in chapter one, verse three, the certain ones are those in his audience. But first he needs to commend himself and his commands to the audience or his command to the audience. So by using this approach, by you, by by not naming the women directly, using an indirect approach, and using the softer, more gentle indirect approach, Paul is seeking to gain rapport with the hearers so they'll be open to what he wants to say. He wants to gain a hearing with them, but he recognizes if I try to come directly and I start naming names, and you say, well, he named Hymen Hymenaeus and Alexander. They had already been put outside the church. These are people still in the church that he wants to reach, but he recognizes they've already been won over. If I come at them directly, it, it could create some hostility. They would shut me out and we could lose them. So Paul here, if Dr. Kitson is correct, and I believe she is, he's showing great pastoral sensitivity and care. 
He wants to reach them. So he utilizes an indirect approach. All right. So this approach is his way of, of winning them over. It's, it's, it's much like when uh, David sinned, right? Remember when he slept with Bathsheba? He killed Uriah, right? To cover up what he did. The prophet comes to David. The prophet does not come to David and immediately say, you have sinned against the Lord. Repent, you sinner. He uses an indirect approach. He tells David a story. This lowers David's defenses. This makes David open to what has to be said. And when David hears what happened, he tells him the story about a man who had a little ewe lamb and another man who was richer came and took it, killed it, and gave it to his friend. And David is angry at this. It appeals to David's sense of justice. And he goes, who is that man? He's going to pay fourfold. And at that moment, the prophet shifts to a direct approach. And he goes, you're the man. But he uses an indirect approach to gain a hearing with David. This And it's a soft approach. It's a gentle approach. It opens David up so the prophet can get a hearing. And this helped the prophet. And, and, and interesting, if we think of the prophet as being guided by God, God uses this approach in order to bring David to repentance. Paul commends, uh, Paul, um, I should say, he commends a softer, gentler approach to Timothy, that Timothy should use a gentle, soft approach when dealing with opposition. Let's read, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're almost finished. I know I've went long here, but I wanted to get all this out because I won't be here next week, by the way. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're, uh, we're going to have service online, but I won't be here. Aaron will be here. And Aaron's not here today because he was sick. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's look at verse 23. Paul commends Timothy a softer, gen gentle approach. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, Paul says to Timothy, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. So this has to do with the false teaching because that's where the strife comes from. Knowing that they generate strife. Okay, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So Paul is suggesting to Timothy, I want you to take this gentle approach to reach those people who've embraced these false teachings don't argue with them. Be gentle. Be patient in the hopes that God will get them repentance so they'll turn away from the false teaching to the truth of God. Now, Paul, again, he named Hymenaeus and Alexander. They had already been removed from the church. This suggests that they refused to stop spreading their false teaching. Remember in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 through 5, Paul talked about those. Uh, he said, if you don't go to sound teaching in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you hold on to this false teaching, Paul tells Timothy, withdraw yourself from such men. I want to suggest that Hymenaeus and Alexander refused to turn away from their false teaching. As a result, the church had to withdraw. Paul turned them over to uh, Satan, which is a way of saying they were put outside the church. This is why they are named. They were already put out. But this is why Paul does not name the women. He believes that these women can be reached um, so that they can turn away from the false teaching. Paul is seeking to win them over. So for the person who said to me, why doesn't Paul name the women? This is why he's using a rhetorical strategy and, and rhetoric has to do with the art of persuasion. Paul doesn't always just command. Paul uses rhetorical strategies to win the hearts and minds of people. All right, hope you learned a lot. I knew this was a lot. Take some time to go back over this again if you enjoyed it, if you got a lot out of it. I also want to suggest to you, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, KIC TV, if you're not a subscriber, become a subscriber. Um, come in in the comment section below. Share this video with other people. It helps to spread our message. I want to thank you for joining us. And I'll be back probably in about two weeks. We're going to be talking about the next passage of scripture where Paul says, uh, for Adam was formed, formed first, for, for Eve was not formed first. For, slow down. For Eve was not formed first, but Adam, and the woman was in the transgression and not the man. We're going to talk about that because often that is seen as another reason why women can't be in authority. We're going to talk about what that means in its cultural context. All right. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.